Chapter 12, The Basic Content of Model State Statutes for Revitalizing the Militia of the Several States. The last but plainly the most important step in revitalizing the militia of the several states will involve enacting the necessary legislation in each state. A. As explained above, model statutes will be drafted by CHSA statewide coordinating committees. B. The first model statutes, actually to be tested in the political arena, should be designed for one or more carefully selected states in which the electorate is generally sympathetic to the right of the people to keep and bear arms, where influential legislators can be recruited, and where sufficient CHSAs can be formed. In order to maintain historical continuity and take full advantage of legal precedents in the pre-constitutional militia acts and other authorities, these states should be drawn from among the original 13 colonies. If, however, this proves impractical, then some other states must take the lead. The goal is to revitalize the militia somewhere, sometime soon. If that requires making history and setting precedents, so be it. C. The first model statutes should limit enrollment in the militia to, or at least rely primarily on, volunteers. To be sure, a modern statute that adopted the exact pattern of the pre-constitutional militia acts would at once embrace the whole body of we the people qualified for the militia, which today would include all the able-bodied men from 16 to 60 years of age, together with a very large proportion of the able-bodied women in the community. Under contemporary conditions, however, revitalization of the militia should take place sequentially starting with only a portion of the community for no less than two reasons. First, the militia of the several states having been inoperative and even unknown altogether for so long in every state, a sudden translation of most individuals from no involvement at all to full participation compelled by law may surely startle and possibly antagonize many. To minimize initial resistance to the plan, proponents must avoid advocating the imposition of legal duties. To minimize initial resistance to the plan, proponents must avoid advocating the imposition of legal duties on potential supporters before the latter are psychologically prepared and morally committed. Then, too, full enrollment in the militia will require gradually maximizing public education about and enthusiasm for these institutions. But steadily enhancing the community's familiarity with and confidence in them. Volunteerism instead of statutory coercion is the fairest and most expeditious method for achieving this result. Second, in light of the pressing demands of homeland security, Revitalization of the militia must be proven workable as soon as possible, so that those establishments can be rapidly expanded with an expectation of success. This can best be accomplished by initially enrolling a small but select group of individuals whose integrity and reliability are beyond question, who are highly motivated, who come to the duty already at least minimally trained and equipped, and therefore who can be expected to perform effectively and thereby set proper examples. Third, in keeping with their patriotic purposes, the revitalized militia should enroll their first members by appeal to personal honor, virtue, and responsibility. In a state militia's formative stages, that their neighbors freely enlist will shame shirkers and defaulters into a recognition and assumption of their civic duty far more effectively than legal sanctions. One way to combine historical continuity with volunteerism would be for a model statute to require everyone in the community qualified for the militia formally to enroll and complete a questionnaire concerning education, training, skills, and other relevant matters, so that militia headquarters could compile an inventory 
of all the manpower potentially available, but to permit almost everyone to claim an exemption from all or most militia duty, thereby making service effectively voluntary. Individuals with certain indispensable skills, such as medical personnel and disaster relief specialists, might be allowed only limited exemptions, and everyone otherwise exempted, except those individuals with serious disabilities or conscientious objections, might nonetheless be required to maintain in their homes and obtain tactical and legal instruction in the use of firearms and ammunition, even though they were not liable to perform any other regular militia duty. D. Recruitment of volunteers for the militia should start with private citizens who hold state or local permits to carry concealed firearms, or CCPs. 1. A. Thousands of ordinary Americans with CCPs are already performing a deterrent, and sometimes an actual defensive function in a small-scale, random manner within their own communities, not only without, rec not only without recompense, but also at no insignificant personal expense incurred for firearms, training, insurance, and so on. They are, however, largely unaware of how their present activities constitute part of the quintessential militia function of executing the laws, how those activities render them ad hoc homeland security forces, how they could significantly increase their effectiveness if state and localities made them even a small amount of advanced instruction available to them, and especially how they could multiply their contributions to their communities by serving as cadres for revitalization of the militia of the several states. And neither they nor the state or local agencies issuing their CCPs, nor the big media, engage in widespread publicity emphasizing how the ever-increasing prevalence on the streets of firearms in private citizens' hands deters violent crimes. Apparently, nonetheless, the message has percolated to a significant degree into the underworld through informal channels. This situation could and should be corrected by organizing, training, equipping, and legally empowering as militia personnel the largest possible number of Americans with CCPs, extending the geographical range of these citizens' operations by eliminating as many gun-free zones as possible, broadcasting to violent criminals the extent of this mobilization so as to maximize ex its deterrent Broadcasting, the broadcasting to violent criminals the extent of this mobilization so as to maximize its deterrent effect, and based upon the recruitment and experiences of these CCP holders, expanding the militia of the several states as rapidly as practicable. B. Americans with CCPs constitute the ideal set of Americans from which to draw the first cadres for revitalizing the militia for numerous reasons. First, they typically are patriotic, law-abiding, personally responsible, and socially concerned individuals who tend strongly to envision the defense of themselves and their families as an inextricable part of the defense of their communities as a whole. Second, to obtain their CCPs, they have been cleared through various national, state, and local background checks as suitable persons to carry concealed firearms in public places, or at least as persons not disqualified per force of criminal background, mental illness, or some other constitutionally permissible cause, and presumably as persons who can be trusted to use those firearms responsibly for justifiable defense of themselves or others should the need arise. Third, they have received some instruction or training in the use of firearms, and often the laws relating thereto, especially as a condition and precedent, especially as a condition precedent to obtaining their CCPs. At a relatively low cost and commitment of time, they could be educated to the higher standard necessary for performance of the functions initially required of them in the militia. For many CCP holders too, additional training would be a simple matter, because of their former service in the armed forces, 
police, security agencies, and related employments. Fourth, by carrying concealed firearms in public places, they have already evidenced their willingness to make a serious commitment to themselves and their families, as well as sometimes to their friends and co-workers. Undoubtedly, in the same spirit many of them would make a further personal commitment to revitalization of the militia of the several states. Fifth, and a decisive advantage from the practical perspective of education, mobilization, and organization, they can be easily contacted because their CCPs are matters of public record. Two, a model statute revitalizing the militia should assign definite, quote, homeland security duties to those holders of CCPs who do not affirmatively seek exemption. In keeping with the responsibilities to watch by night and to ward by day, often found in the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts, two categories of duty should be mandated. Namely, on general alert, all members of the militia who hold CCPs should be required, one, to carry concealed firearms in the regular course of all of their normal activities outside of their homes, two, to alert for and respond to any apparent violations of the law, social disorders, natural disasters, or other public dangers. 3. To report those matters to regular police forces or other authorities. And if the situation so warrants, to take whatever prudent direct action may be indicated, pending such authorities' intervention. And 4. Whenever called upon to do so, to render all possible assistance to local and state police, national law enforcement agencies, the Border Patrol, the Coast Guard, the National Guard, and the armed forces in the performance of their homeland security functions. On active patrol, holders of CCPs who specially volunteer should be assigned to regular and random patrols of public places and facilities and private businesses that function as places of public accommodation or that involve particularly dangerous operations or conditions. Some patrols would be conducted in cooperation with local and state police, the Border Patrol, the Coast Guard, or the National Guard. Others would fall within the responsibilities of the militia alone. To perform these duties, members of the militia should be vested by statute with at least sufficient police power to stop detain, seize, search, arrest, interrogate, and investigate suspects or perpetrators. 3. To guarantee that members of the militia are able to perform these tasks, the model statute should require them to complete and should provide adequate facilities and funding for specialized training in several areas. First, in laws relating to self-defense, defense of others, use of deadly force, and exercises of general police powers. Second, in the operation and tactical use of the particular firearms militia personnel will actually carry, above and beyond whatever qualifications may be necessary and sufficient to obtain a CCP. And third, in parapolice, paramilitary, counterterrorism, and anti-gang theories, methods, and tactics, at least equivalent to such instruction provided to the rank-and-file personnel of other agencies with whom militia personnel may find themselves on patrol. 4. Finally, members of the militia should also receive statutory protections for themselves and their property, including creation of a state militia court with exclusive jurisdiction to hear and determine all cases involving civil claims or criminal charges that damages to person or property resulted from the use of a firearm or any other exercise of police powers by a member of the militia in the course of their duty. A declaration that any and all firearms, ammunition, and related accoutrements individuals officially certify as their militia equipment and actually employ for that purpose are immune from every judgment, 
assessment, seizure, lien, encumbrance, or liability from any debt, tax, charge, or other legal claim, public or private, solvable in money. A declaration that any and all firearms, ammunition, and related accoutrements individuals officially certify as their militia equipment and actually employ for that purpose are necessary to the performance of an indispensable state governmental function, and as such, those materials are immune from any of the general government's gun control laws, because the only power of Congress in the premises is to provide for arming the militia, not for disarming them of the very firearms the states have explicitly designated as militia arms. And provision of severe criminal and civil sanctions against any and all individuals who steal, damage, or otherwise misuse firearms and other equipment officially certified as militia equipment. I'll interject again here with the good news that these things are currently in development and dissemination in the form of the PSUCJ, or the Public Servants Uniform Code of Justice, which will be linked in the description. Dr. Vieri continues, 5. Needless to emphasize, the foregoing suggestions are only indicative, not all-inclusive. In every state, the actual legislation necessary to revitalize the militia of the several states will be far more comprehensive. Drafting the necessary bills, however, must await the work of CHSAs in each state. Just as with a complex economy, homeland security cannot be planned from the top down by some political or bureaucratic elite. Rather, it must be built from the bottom up by we the people ourselves. E. A statute for revitalizing the militia of the several states, along the outlines presented in this book, should appeal to state legislators for several reasons. First, revitalization of the militia will go a long way towards solving the problem of homeland security, a problem with which some of the states must successfully grapple before the general government fouls up the situation beyond correction. Second, revitalization of the militia will provide a solution that can mobilize large numbers of their constituents behind the legislators, or in the default of quick action by incumbents, their opponents in subsequent elections, who support it. Third, the proposed statute will provide more than a merely theoretical approach, because its principles will have been designed and actually tested in the most effective manner possible through the formation and operation of the state's CHSAs. And fourth, once enacted, the statute can be put into practice immediately, because numerous knowledgeable, skilled, and enthusiastic volunteers will come forward from among the people who have joined or been influenced by CHSAs. End of chapter 12. Conclusion. A major task with minimal time. Admittedly, revitalization of the militia of the several states throughout the United States will entail a massive effort among thousands of patriotic Americans willing to contribute their time and money in their country's service. But no other acceptable alternative offers itself, as now being implemented, the general government's scheme for homeland security is destined to fail, either by shortchanging this country on protection, or by producing a national police state, or, most likely, both. Revitalization of the militia could provide everything that true homeland security demands. Indeed, for reasons far beyond the supposed needs of the ostensible war on terrorism, revitalization of the militia should have occurred many yesterdays ago. Today, America cannot wait for too many tomorrows, 
because her options are rapidly running out. So this job needs to be started immediately, if not sooner, and finished quickly, whatever the effort and whatever the cost. Why then does this book not simply present a model statute and encourage Americans to promote it state by state? Because it cannot be done, and they will not do it. A top-down, one-size-fits-all proposal will always prove inadequate. The craftsman-like approach must go beyond a generic statute couched in legal generalities, and instead must address the particular and peculiar homeland security needs and resources of each state individually. Those needs and resources must be ascertained at the local level, because that is where the information, the interest, and the incentives for effective investigation, planning, and action are available. Moreover, a statute alone, no matter how well drafted, is not enough. Even more requisite are large numbers of patriotic citizens, ready and willing, not just to think and talk about such a statute, but also to take action to bring it into existence and to see to its enactment and implementation. There must be a collective and coordinated, not simply individual and haphazard, commitment of time, talent, effort, and money. Mobilization on this scale, though, requires an organizational principle, method, and goal. In particular, envisioning the ideal of revitalizing the militia of the several states on a state-by-state, locality-by-locality basis. Arousing enthusiasm for the idea. Establishing a means to focus the effort. Here, through the Citizens' Homeland Security Associations. Educating the CHSA's members and pooling their knowledge and resources. Investigating all aspects of local homeland security. Devising, planning, testing, and refining the duties, powers, structure, and functions of the revitalized militia. Drafting a state statute, the suitability of which has been proven. Encouraging state legislatures to enact the statute. Engaging in electoral activism to change the composition of the state legislature if positive results are not obtained from incumbents. And participating in the militia pursuant to the statute as finally enacted. People, and a system for organizing them, are still not enough, however. Also necessary is a collective commitment to the ultimate goal, which is not simply revitalization of the militia for their own sake. The militia, after all, are not the ends, but merely the means. As the Second Amendment teaches, the militia are necessary to the security of a free state. The goal, therefore, is a secure, free state. A state in which the people need not fear their public officials because they actually govern themselves. The militia will never be revitalized, or if revitalized, will never live up to their potential without common Americans' personal commitment to self-government and the revitalization of it through self-help. Neither this book nor any other can give self government to any people. In any era, no founding fathers exist separate from the people. For leaders can never emerge and in any event must prove useless without followers committed to the common purpose. In the final analysis, the people must understand self-government and want it and work for it, and assert it, and defend it themselves. Opponents of the militia will invent all sorts of objectives, attempt to incite interminable debate, and generally strive to impede progress in every imaginable way. The answer to their criticisms and complaints must be that we the people are here to make history, not to quibble about it. 
The historical facts and legal principles that require revitalization of the militia of the several states are clear. The time to apply them is now. End of Constitutional Homeland Security by Dr. Edwin Vieira, Jr. Presented by the Free Citizens of America's School of the U.S. Constitution. We hope you'll join us for the next installment and subscribe and support us in this work.